Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you have a cell phone, please uh, uh, silence it before we start. Uh, if you're not on our email list, what would like to be the box is over there. Uh, next Tuesday, we begin the Ruth Pollock Labor Heritage Week. We're very honored to have uh, Denise Giardina with us, who is a legendary West Virginia novelist. Uh, she has not been able to travel for quite some time, but she'll be here in Wheeling. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the event will feature uh, a panel that will include uh, our friend Mark Harshman and Pat Cassidy, and possibly a, a third. Can you turn the sound off, please? Thank you. Okay, let's uh, talk about our guest today. Tony Hilton has been around journalism for more than 76 of his 77 years. He was less than a month old when printer's ink was applied to his feet and images made on the newsprint as the sports writer father held it. Tony's connection with this honorable profession has taken many forms as an editor publisher of the Hinton West Virginia Daily News, now the Hinton News, visiting professor of journalism at Susquehanna University, public relations practitioner for a national trade association in Washington, D.C., and a steel company in northern West Virginia, communication director for AARP Virginia and public information officer for a major U.S. Army headquarters in the Republic of Vietnam. This novel, Enough, that you'll be hearing about today, features the interaction of journalism and the brand of rough and tumble politics found in southern West Virginia in 1960, found in northern West Virginia, too. <laughs> Tony is a proud graduate of WVU, Bachelor of Science in Journalism. Yay, WVU and Masters of Arts Political Science. Please welcome Tony Hill. Thank you, Sean. It's uh, good to be here today. And uh, I really thank you for the kind invitation. Now, as you can tell from the cover of the book, A Building on Fire, there's a little excitement uh, in this novel, and it's about Southern West Virginia politics, and uh, I guess excitement is one word you can use. A lot of people use a lot of other words uh, from time to time. Now, an important aspect of enough is to see how a community-oriented newspaper can be a positive force. It reports what kids do, it reports Little League, even kids that make uh, honor roll in some high schools, smaller, smaller papers uh, do that. And it has the ability to bring a community together. It helps instill, help instill pride. But this aspect of newspaper is not what enough is about. Enough is about the importance of a free press in our democracy and how corrupt politics can endanger that same democracy. Now, in recent political history in this country, we've got a new term, fake news. And uh, as I wrote a letter to the editor in the Dominion Post, I still sound off. Occasionally, Doug and Doc, and, uh, Bob Ryan and Doug Huff have been friends uh, for some years, and I've got to watch myself because if they start start telling stories on me, uh, we're all in trouble. But anyway, I in my letter to the editor, I pointed out that fake news became uh, news with which we disagreed not uh, inaccurate news, but if we just disagreed it, agreed with it, then we let people know about that. Now, to my way of thinking, news media has a big
big responsibility of making all the politicians mad at one time or another. Now that might seem strange, but all politicians, Republican, Democrat, conservative, and liberal, make mistakes. And if the news media is doing its job, they'll point those out. So all sides of politics hate the press. You ask them, what do you think of the television station? Or what do you think of the social media site? Or what do you think of the news? Well, they're trying to stir up trouble all the time. They've, uh, they just uh, don't report the facts. Well, that means that that particular politician has gotten caught uh, doing something. And human nature, we always remember the bad done to us and uh, remember uh, and don't remember the good. So while fake news has been with us for some time with other names, it's a term most associated with the political uh, scene in the last few years. Now, I did a little research on news and presence. And I stumbled onto a site, Mount Vernon's historical site, and it said that one reason George Washington didn't run for re-election in 1796 is because he was getting bad press. So the, uh, the animosity between presidents and the press didn't start in uh, 2016. Now, the term fake news is frankly repugnant to me, but it got traction because reporters weren't checking facts. They didn't take the time to be fair and accurate, which is what Paul Atkins taught us at WBU. They let their personal biases get into the news call. So then a politician can find a mistake, start yelling fake news, and it reflects on everybody that happens to be in the news business. Fair and accurate. Now reporters have biases. They're human but they've got to keep that out of the news call. They just report the facts. Now there's a place in the news media for opinions, editorial pages, commentary, that type of thing, but it has to be clearly identified. Now, if the news media makes politicians mad on each side, and the colonial press was much worse than what we have today. They were brutal. How in the world did freedom of the press get into the First Amendment? The founding fathers, the leading politicians of their day, realized that public officials being human would let power go to their head and misuse their offices at times. Now, the Founding Fathers didn't restrict the press, didn't license the press, and didn't try to control the press. They came up with a non- government, completely independent, free press to hold public officials accountable. Think about that. They couldn't control it, they didn't try to restrict it, and they didn't license it. Do you know of any politician today that would have that kind of vision 
Now, this was 250, 245 years ago. Now, that gives you a little background on my feelings toward freedom of the press generally. Now, I worked on this book for 15 years in my mind before I ever printed or submitted it to be printed. And I had to select a time period for enough. A book about journalism and politics in Southern West Virginia. Ooh, scary thought. There's only one choice. The presidential Democratic primary in 1960 between Hubert Humphrey and John Kennedy. And before I get into the plot of enough, I want to give you some background on my first experience with politics. I grew up in Logan County, and that's sort of a strike against me right there. But I want to tell you, we were principled in Logan County. We had one political rule that we would not break. We would never discriminate against somebody's right to vote just because they're dead. <laughs> now that does bring us a chuckle, but isn't it a serious tone, serious issue? When someone embarks on a crime to eliminate the impact of our legal vote. That's uh, not a good thing. Now, my first experience with uh, politics, I'm 78, and it was about 66 years ago, I was handing out cards, and back then you could hand out cards as people went in to vote, for a fellow running for Board of Education that was a friend of my parents. And I noticed in the parking lot there that these guys were coming to vote, but they'd go over here and talk to these folks that had signs out for a candidate, and then they'd go over here and talk to these guys that had other signs out for other candidates. And I asked a friend of mine, I said, what's going on here? And the friend explained they wanted to know who was going to pay the most for their vote. So I said, well, how are they going to know who they vote for? And he pointed to a classroom window in the school where the polling place was. About that time, this poll worker came to the window, looked out, and scratched his side of his face. That was a signal to the folks in the parking lot that the guy coming out voted right. Okay? So he got his rock gut liquor or a couple bucks, whatever he got for his vote. So that was the way that I got introduced to politics in Southern West Virginia. Now, my dad, who worked for the Logan Banner, he explained several elections later about the chain ballot. Have any of y'all ever heard about the chain ballot? God bless you. <laughs> well, chain ballot would happen is a fellow would come up and decide to sell his vote, and the vote buyer would give him a piece of paper folded about the size of a ballot. And that guy put the piece of blank paper in his pocket. And he'd go in, sign in to vote, get the regular ballot, go into the voting booth and pull the curtain. He would take out the blank piece of paper, fold the ballot, put it in his pocket. Pull the curtain back, go out real fast and put the blank piece of paper in the ballot box. Then he'd go outside. And he'd hand the unmarked ballot to the vote buyer, which would give him the money or half pint of rock gut liquor. 
and the vote buyer would take that blank ballot and mark it for his candidate. And he'd give that to the next vote seller. Vote seller fold that marked ballot, put it in his pocket, go into the precinct, sign his name, get the real ballot unmarked, go into the voting booth, take the pre-marked ballot out, fold the new ballot, put it in his pocket, and put the pre-marked ballot in the voting box and go outside, give the ballot to the vote buyer, the chain was working. Well, a good precinct worker could have a couple chains going at the same time. Now they uh, were able to do that with paper ballots. And now they get a more sophisticated, uh, do it with a lot of uh, uh, the mail-in ballots and ballot harvesting and all sorts of shenanigans that you can work. And it's going on probably today in some places. So that was how my education about Southern West Virginia politics began. And to be sure, now I'm living over in Morgantown, but I'm still learning. People can be real imaginative when it comes to voter fraud. Now, that 1960 election was selected for a couple reasons. First, my father, who I uh, mentioned had covered Southern West Virginia politics for 15 or 20 years before that election, said it was the dirtiest election he had ever seen. Now, in Logan County, <clears throat> when you say something like that, that's a pretty big deal. And he was talking about in terms of vote buying and election fraud. And uh, during that election, they had uh, folks called the Lever Brothers. And our voting machines then, you'd go in and you'd pull the lever back and that would vote and bells would ring. And in some precincts, they bought the election officials, both Republican and Democrat, so people would take the ballot box in and just vote. And it said uh, that bell was ringing so much, it sounded like a telephone. But some years later, I was able to confirm some of the stories I heard about that election. That election was on May the 10th, Tuesday, May the 10th, 1960. And there was this Kennedy supporter in our town Claude Ellis, they called him Big Daddy Claude Ellis. I mean, he was like this. The Friday after that election, he was driving a brand new black four-door Cadillac sedan. And I mean, everybody in town noticed him. So six or eight years later, I uh, went down to Claude's house and went in and I said, Claude, you remember that car back in 19, the big Cadillac you bought? He said, you remember that? I said, hell, everybody in Logan County remembered that car. I said, was that election money? It asked no, Claude. He capped, he laughed. He said, well, of course it was. The Kennedys were most appreciative of my efforts. And uh, his family room was like a monument to the Kennedy family. He had autographed pictures of John and, and Bobby all over the place. So that's one of my stories. But that's not the best. In Logan County in 1960, the chairman of the county Democrat committee was a fellow named Raymond Chaffin. And Raymond Chaffin also worked for A.T. Massey Cole over in Richmond, Virginia. And Raymond was probably one of the biggest Humphrey supporters in the state. He didn't want any Catholic to be elected president. I'll get into that a little bit later. So 
Raymond was campaigning like crazy for Humphrey. And so some people from A.T. Massey came to Logan to have a little prayer meeting with Raymond. And they explained that A.T. Massey sold a lot of coal to a company up in Boston controlled by a fellow named Joe Kennedy. John Kennedy's dad. And this A.T. Massey official said, now Raymond, we're going to give you a choice. You can either support John Kennedy or look for another job. Raymond put pocketbook over principal. He said, I am all in for Kennedy. I can't wait to see him in the White House. So about two days later, Raymond's phone rang. And it was a fellow from Kennedy headquarters in Charleston. He said, Raymond, we're glad you're with us. Now, how much money do you need to set up a precinct organization for Kennedy in Logan County? Well, Raymond was a suspicious type. He thought maybe the phone was being tapped or somebody was over, could overhear him. So Raymond said, 35. Well, Raymond meant 3,500. The Kennedy people in Charleston thought he meant 35,000. So about two days later, a fellow from Kennedy headquarters showed up in Logan with two suitcases filled with $35,000 cash. Now, Raymond told that in a book. He told that story in a book. Of course, the statute of limitations had already run out. But I, I got a friend of mine who lives in Florida now that was in the room when they opened those suitcases. So Raymond probably spent 2,500, 3,000 setting up the precinct organization for Kennedy. And uh, so he, uh, he kept the rest of it. Now, these are the political experiences I've had that helped get me uh, selecting this 1960 primary. But there was another reason about this primary that some of you may remember and some of you may have heard about. It was historical, not just for West Virginia. It's historical for the country. John Kennedy was under fire for being a Catholic. Preachers in Southern West Virginia during the spring of 1960, leading up to that primary, were preaching sermons saying it was a sin to vote for a Catholic. That's hard to believe today. But people swore that the Pope would be running the country if Kennedy was elected. Well, he was and the Pope did but Kennedy decided, and he was getting this criticism all over, and he decided he had to run and win in a heavily Protestant state and pick West Virginia. And that's some of the historical background of why I picked the spring of 1960. And I touch a little bit on that. In fact, in the book, John Kennedy makes a, a cameo appearance. Uh, and just as an aside, I was a senior in Logan High School. I got to shake hands and chat with John Kennedy on the steps of the old Logan County Courthouse on one of these visits. Uh, and at my, now to show you how fierce the campaigning was, 
Hubert Humphrey spoke at the intermission of my senior prom in high school. Okay, they brought him in. It's true, and he he had a son about my age or the age of uh, our high school students, and so he told us to go home and tell his uh, tell our parents to vote for him. Now. I was away from West Virginia politics for a while, uh, while I was in school and then uh, uh, in the Army. And then in uh, 1973, my parents and I bought the Hinton Daily News, which is in Summers County, just down south of uh, Beckley. And in the early days, I got my, I guess you'd say, I got my bachelor's in West Virginia politics uh, while I lived uh, in Logan. But when I got to Hinton, I got my PhD. I mean, I was covering local governmental bodies, city council, board of education, county commission, and I found out how local politics work. Then I was uh, appointed to the House of Delegates and had the misfortune of running for the state senate. Now, I say misfortune because I was a Republican in Southern West Virginia. I mean, we could have met in a, in a telephone book. And I was running in the year of Watergate where the Republican president, Richard Nixon, was run out of the White House. That's not the best of it. My opponent was the chairman of the state Democrat party. Yeah. So the day after the election, a friend of mine came in the newspaper office. He said, help do you know the difference between a politician and a journalist? I said, don't think I do. He looked at me, started laughing and said 2,500 votes and left. But it was extremely Experiences like all of these put together that I tried to reflect in enough. Now, I'll note that enough's fiction because nobody believes what's in there. It's about a small town publisher who takes on an entrenched corrupt political machine in the fiction southern West Virginia County of Jordan. And I had to I had to make the county's name fiction because if I used any of the real names, I'd probably get sued 50 ways from Sunday. And the young publisher took over the paper that had been run by a guy that used it to help the corrupt political machine. He didn't publish anything about their office holders or anything. Rich Hill came in. And he started uh, covering local news. He started telling how the bodies were spending public money. Uh, and the readers, because they were so conditioned, didn't believe him. And then they started asking questions. They started confronting the public officials and the candidates for office. And these two political kingpins were getting uneasy about this principal type of journalism. And they set in motion a conspiracy that results in the paper being burnt to the ground. And they hatch a plot to kill the young publisher on a deserted country road. Enough shows how a corrupt political machine can thrive when a free press doesn't live up to its First Amendment duty of holding public officials accountable. And it shows the behind the scenes of how they use jobs, fire people that don't do the, don't support them, those types of things. Explores the life-threatening challenges a young public or publisher faces or face just to try to bring the truth to the readers of the Lonsville Cry. Now there's a focus on news gathering in a small town, how a wild goose tip 
can develop into a story with a little bit of digging. And those of you that lived in small towns understand how the characters are in small towns. Now, in this book, I've got an 85-year-old woman who is nearly bedridden, who very seldom leaves your house, but knows everything going on in town and gives Rick Hill tips all the time. There's an 81-year-old retired school teacher that people think in, uh, just can hardly walk, probably won't even get out the boat, but she sets up a real powerful, under-the-radar political movement on election day. And then we have Lester Brown, who's the town drunk. And Lester moves in the shadows around town, sees who the police might beat up, who they stop, who they arrest, who they don't arrest. So Lester is another one of the characters. Now the key question in enough is this. Can the black ink on the pages of the Lonsville Crier overcome the mountains, the green ink on the mountains of election cash that the corrupt politicians are going to spend to stay in power? Is it possible that we, the people, will rise up with their ballots and throw the crooks out? Rick Hill, the publisher, doesn't believe it's possible. Now, I want to read you a, just a short, if I can find it, a short part of the book, Enough. The three vehicles departed Lonsville in different directions. Driving the winding road south along the lake, Rick Hill tensed as he saw headlights fast approaching from behind. Two vehicles sped by, an older red beat up pickup truck and a black four door sedan. The tail lights, their tail lights disappeared around the curb on the far side of the lake bridge that connected the sparsely populated Longwood area with the rest of Jordan County. Riding shotgun with Rick was Al's close friend Larry, who had volunteered and brought along his 12 gauge. As they headed up the hill and around the curve, just beyond the south end of the bridge, a row of barrels filled with burning logs blocked the road. The obstruction was in a narrow part of the road, so Rick couldn't get around it or turn around. There was no one in sight as the publisher brought the van to a stop about 60 feet from the flames. Rick hit the CB button saying, we've got trouble into the bridge. There was no response, only static. He and Larry slowly got out of the van, guns in hand. Three men wearing ski masks and carrying long guns and lit by the flames from the roadblock came around and ordered Rick and Larry to drop their guns. You just don't learn. We're going to shut you up this time, Hill, one of the armed men shouted, words used in phone calls to the paper that afternoon. Get away from the van, he growled, as a round ricocheted off the pavement and hit the van. A fourth man with a rifle came out of the shadows behind the roadblock, pointed towards the van. Let's use the van for cover and run back down the highway and into the woods, Rick whispered to Larry. The four masked men started moving around the roadblock towards the van. As Rick and Larry moved towards the wood, keeping the van between them and the advancing gunman. The four got around the van and spotted Rick and Larry at the edge of the woods and began firing. Rick and Larry got off a couple rounds, sending the gunman back, crouching behind the van. Damn you, one of the gunmen yelled as they resumed firing. Rick and Larry 
back deeper into the woods, their eyes never leaving the masked men trying to kill them. A yell sliced through the crisp spring night as a round ricocheted off the pavement and hit Rick's left leg. He fell against a sturdy pine. Then a bullet ripped into Larry's left arm. He dropped to his knees but got up and grabbed Rick's jacket and pulled him through a muddy ditch deeper in the woods. Despite the wound, Rick picked up his shotgun and fired two shots toward the advancing mass quartet, causing them to again retreat. With his good arm, Larry dragged the bleeding, cussing newspaper man to the cover of two towering oaks as bullets ripped through the trees on our side, all sides. I dropped my gun when they hit my arm, Larry whispered in desperation. Hell, I've only got six shots left, Rick responded as they watched the four moving towards the wood behind the van. That's just uh, one of the more interesting parts of enough. That concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions or any observations. Yes, ma'am. My in-laws are from Charleston, mm -hmm. I've been exposed to a lot of this. My father-in-law was CFO of Richard Equipment, which sold heavy duty equipment for road construction. Did you know Eddie Thacker? Yes. I've well, been we went to school with Eddie Thacker. Yeah, yeah. I've done Okay. Daddy, okay. Out there. But my father in law always talked about the roads being built and they would contract for maybe 12 inches of concrete. But he may only have 10 inches, however. And it was the money. And, you know, and anti Catholicism was very big in Bluefield at that time. Yes. And also, um, uh, and I, I don't want to say semitism, but against black people, you had you know, a barrier. Yep. You know, no matter what, you had a barrier. Yep. And I will never forget going to Charleston the first time, and then going on to Bluefield, you know, finding out that you still had colored um, um, water fountains, and then you had a white water. And when um, the Civil Rights Act was passed, the Bluefield swimming pool was closed. If you wanted to swim, you were the country club. Mm -hmm. And I was not that exposed to that being from Wheeling. You know, ours was, was segregated, but not to that extent. So it was a real eye opener. Yep. But I, I still remember that I talked about the comments. You know, and the West Virginia Turnpike, and when it was built, and how much money was spent. So. Well, I I think it's gone on quite a bit all over. Yes, Bob. Was Jacob, was John Jacob the sheriff? Uh, I think no. He, if anything, he might have been a great great nephew. Don, Don was running around back in the 1920s, but they were up from the same part of the county, up Main Alley Creek, around Omar and stared up that way. Right. He, he uh, in fact, uh, the 100th anniversary of that Blair Mountain and all of that will be celebrated in Charleston, September the 4th, I think. But the part about the payoff for road construction, uh, that is uh, something that uh, I'm sure I had never heard it fine tuned to how they did it, but uh, that explains a lot. Explains a lot. Any other questions or observations? Yeah, I've done. Uh, you, 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 you,
Well, I'll I'll call on you to uh, to favor certain politicians in your editorials or uh, things like that. Well, I never uh, favored any politicians. Even when I ran for state senate, I would give the same amount of coverage to my opponent. But when I covered the city council or the board of education, and they tried to go into executive session once. I refused to leave the room and told them it was an illegal executive session and they backed out. A um, member of the county commission tried to do the same thing and they backed out. He threatened to put me in jail and I wrote a city council story and this is a little bit about enough and uh, that put these guys in an uh, unfavorable position and uh, one of the agreed members of the city administration went through the halls of City Hall, said he was going to burn that paper down and shut up Rick Hill. And a law enforcement, one of the city police called and said that he had, uh, he was on a night shift, leave all the lights on in the paper, and he would uh, check it overnight. So I had uh, those confrontations. Uh, occasionally, and the reason that is, is the way the paper was run before I took it over, the way we started covering everything. So we can appreciate that. Any other questions or observations? Well, again, I appreciate, uh, Sean, I appreciate so much you having me. Uh, this was a, a delightful experience. And uh, I'll be glad to visit with you up here, autograph a book for you. And uh, I'm glad to give you an inside look on the Southern West Virginia politics of 1960. Thank you very much. That, that way? No. They've got away with paper ballots, but they do, if there's shenanigans going on, it has to do with the absentee and mail-in ballots. That's, that's the way they do it uh, today. And about five years ago, down in Wayne County, they put the county clerk and several other people in jail for messing. So uh, people get real independent sometimes, unfortunately. Okay, well thank you so much.